Right, so good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, just coming into the group now, I'm just making sure that we're all live. I've got my other screen here. Yes, we're in. Oh my God, it's exciting. Um, right, just bear with me, everybody. I've just got one more thing I've got to do. Oh, I've got to get rid of that there. Excellent, good, we're in. Good evening, everybody. Uh, people are coming into the room now, so I'm just gonna let you all come in. Um, it's great to see you all here this evening. Wow, what a, what a talk we've got lined up tonight. We've got the amazing, wonderful Tura Drugas and Steph. Now, Steph, uh, what surname would you like tonight? Oh, there's a tough one, Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because obviously we've got, we've got, um, oh, yeah. you've got, uh, oh, you've got it on the, oh, you got it on, of course, yes, Steph, that's okay, no, fine, because you've also got a different surname on, on Facebook, haven't you, sometimes? I have, now for most of my life I've changed my married name, which is Cronin, but because yeah. I had already a book published under Russo, I'm, for my dog stuff, I'm sticking with Russo, so probably best to stick with Russo, Andrew. And that sounds very starry stroke Devery, doesn't it? To have a, a to have a pen name, a stage name, you know, um, uh, and then and then to have your kind of everyday life name. So that's yeah. quite cool. Well, welcome both of you. So we've we've spoken before, of course, Steph. Uh, Turid, we haven't. So it's great to speak to you tonight. I've spoken to your wonderful daughter several times. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got somebody extra here, everybody tonight, as you can see, um, Mrs. Dolly Parton. Everybody. Uh, so um, we're doing some renovation here. So if you see Dolly coming over my shoulder, all the stuff is piled into the office here. And this is my husband's Dolly. So if you, if you see her uh, peeking over my shoulder, that's what's going on. So welcome, everybody. Uh, people are coming in now. Uh, Kim, hi, Matt, Alice, uh, Marina, uh, Em, Kerry, Monica. We've got lots of people in here already. So that's great to see. Good. So we're going to be chatting tonight about the book that you two have uh, just put out how to raise a puppy and this is a really big thing for me because we've, we've just finished doing that ourselves with molly and a lot of people who follow my uh page and the and the group will know about that so do you know what this book i, I it was just amazing it, almost every other page i was just doing little yes 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 and i know the feedback at steph and to it i know you've found already by people who've already got the book has been amazing and we've been waiting for this book for quite a while I think so there's a lot of things for us to unpack tonight and I just want to kind of curate this conversation and build it up everybody in the room I want to allow a bit of time for some questions but if we can hold those towards the end a little bit because otherwise I won't be able to find them and um, so I'll be able to see them in the room we've got amazing uh, viewing figures already tonight which is great so this is something that everybody wants to have a little listening to I think we'll start with you Steph um, briefly because uh, I think it's uh, good to think about where the inspiration for the book came from and, and it was you had that kind of initial seed didn't you? I did. Yeah, um, no, I, I think I'll start saying something because mm -hmm. I have always I have always uh, some projects going and ideas to do things and I always have some manuscripts I work on uh, but I never started to do any about uh, puppies, even if all the puppy books I read irritated me endlessly because uh, it was too much rubbish that didn't have anything to do with puppies in them. So, uh, but I never did it because uh, I felt it was such a big task. And then Stephanie came along <laughs> and she <laughs> asked me, if I would mind doing a puppy book together with her. Okay, you tell Steph. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> well, I suppose the first the first time I became aware of Tourid's objections to all of the puppy books that were on the market was back in around 2016 or 2017. And I was doing Tourid's education in the UK. Um, and one of the course participants put up their hands and asked Tourid if she could recommend a puppy book. And we were all ready with our pens to write down the recommendations, which were sure to come. But she just said, no, no, there are no good puppy books in English that I can recommend. Um, and then it was a good, good few years later, I think we were at um, an AGM in Rome, a pet dog trainers of Europe AGM in Rome. And I had done the office dogs book and I was feeling in need of a bit of a project. So I asked Turid, would she consider um, writing a puppy book with me? And she said, no, 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 you do it on your own and I'll help. <laughs> but, um, what I really wanted, because 
anyone who's had who's had the pleasure of attending any of Turid's seminars she's got so much knowledge and she's so willing to share it I thought it would be really nice to have a book that I suppose conveyed Turid's philosophy on puppies so I felt if it was going to be her philosophy I definitely wanted her to have a big involvement I didn't just want to do it and sort of take credit for it um because what I wanted to convey was Turid's philosophy and all the things that that I'd learned from her down through the years about dogs and puppies um, and then we worked on it during COVID really from very early on I was hoping to get over to Turid to do some work on it in person um, but it ended up being lots and lots of emails back and forth and drafts back and forth and then finally last year I did get over to see her and we had a look at, at it but it was pretty much done by then and um, mm-hmm. So that's, we did that's, a lot of the work uh, that week, didn't we? We did, we did a lot of work that week. Yeah, yeah. We got a lot done. It yeah. is amazing how efficient it can be if you discuss things and brainstorm and really get uh, some ideas to put down. It's amazing how quick it can go then. Yeah. And yeah. there's some challenges with the format of a book in a way because we can have these ideas and we have these kind of philosophers if you like our ideologies and how we think about things but then we have to try and convey that to a general public who we have to recognize the zeitgeist around them is 30 years out of date at, mm. at, at best right um many of them haven't even thought about you the, the move to positive reinforcement or the shift away from dominance let alone anything else so that must have been a consideration for both of you then when you're actually thinking about the format of the book then how do we get this so people can pick that up and think I can relate and connect to that I yeah I I don't know do you have anything to comment on that stuff um not really I suppose um I suppose I didn't really think of it that way I suppose what I wanted was something as you say that people could relate to but I suppose I wasn't really thinking about where they might be coming from I was hoping that people would be coming to it with an open mind and a a new puppy Um, and I suppose as well I was thinking that a lot of people coming to it would be maybe a little bit familiar with with Turid anyway and 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 her philosophy Um, so I suppose I certainly wasn't approaching it well I, I wasn't approaching it really with a view to to converting people um but at the same time I was quite keen that we would have all the sort of relevant references in there um I suppose there was an awareness that there would be a degree of resistance to what we were saying and that it would be a process in a way we just started out and it was a process we came down to what we wanted to tell people yeah I think we all have to recognise, no matter what you put out, there will always be somebody who will object to something. And uh, and I think uh, if we start writing or producing material to try and navigate that, we end up losing the authentic message that we're trying to put across. And I, but what I loved about the book, what I love about the book, is it has quite a kind of, um, it has a, it has a narrative style to it. And having spoken to you off air previously, Steph, before. Uh, I can feel a lot of that from you in the book, I think, uh, because it has that kind of that narrative style as you go through. Some of these books can feel quite formulaic, but this doesn't. It has it, it is easy to connect to the narrative about what you're trying to say. So um, so that's really interesting. I think it's, it's always so interesting when I've spoken to other people who have collaborated around something like a book. Uh, you know, the challenges that come with that. But from what you've said to me, uh, Steph, previously is that this just seemed to be a, quite an organic, natural process that seemed to really work between the two of you. Yeah, I think so. I think we worked quite well on a tour. What do you think? Did you feel yeah. that it went quite well? Yes, I think so. We worked well together and uh, talking about things, you always get to some, yeah, uh, it, was a, it was a nice process. It really was. And I think like, I would always be very open about the fact that Turid would be my one of my greatest influences when it when it comes to my approach. So and I did do her course. So I suppose that helped. There wasn't. I don't think. I don't think I was trying to to bring in anything that was majorly, 
you know, different mm. to what what Dorit would have would have told. No, I, I think we were very much online, and uh, but the good thing is that Steph uh, is good at uh, her language English, which uh, I am not. I'm a autodidact to say it like that. And uh, that was really good because she could uh, correct me when she understood what I meant, but didn't say it uh, in the right way. And that was a challenge as well, actually, because when I was, like when, when Tour had say sent me something for the book, it's quite difficult to maintain what someone is saying and maintain their tone and mm. still have a uniform tone throughout the book. That was a challenge to keep mm. both voices, yeah. but with one consistent tone, I guess. And mm. Tourette would be a lot more, I think, maybe blunt than I would be. I think I'd probably oh, yeah. oh, yes. <laughs> be a little less direct than Tourette would be. <laughs> so striking the balance, I think, that captured both of our voices was, was a little bit of a challenge. You have so to remember I'm Norwegian that we are much more blunt and direct in everything <laughs> than most people. So that's how it is. Yes. So that's a, nice, like. that's a nice balance there, isn't it? Because I think, uh, yeah. so on that point, actually, and this is the last little bit just about on the kind of pre-book side of things, because I want to get into the content and, and the philosophies and the ideologies as you're talking about stuff. But just... Um, it's a bit of a naughty question, really, but did you fall out about anything? Was there some things that when you're saying, Steph, Turid, we can't say that? Or Turid, you're saying to Steph, no, Steph, we must say it. <laughs> well, we probably had a few times something, but we sorted it out quite easily, I think. Do you know, the one thing that I was a bit worried about was, um, uh, I think it was around the bit when we were talking about getting puppies and... Yeah, you know puppies would often be a little bit under the weather when they come home from the all mm. of the upheaval and I think in the initial draft I had said something about a vet if, if they got worse bring them to the vet and Tour had said she had no faith in vets <laughs> but she no. she didn't want to be deferring to any vets but I was sort of I was sort of a bit worried that if we didn't say that <laughs> and then somebody's puppy no. was sick and they didn't bring them to the vet they'd be blaming us <laughs> No, uh, and you know, the reason is basically that uh, there are no, not many good vets in, in my country. And I would really be uh, careful not to, to go there if I can avoid it. Uh, you seem to have a little bit more faith in it. So, okay, that was a little, but uh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's how it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting isn't it because I think um you know too your work's been so seminal and so important and I think uh and you've obviously spent you've dedicated your life really to to not only continuing to allow the dogs to tell you their story but also how you then translate that and communicate that to others so they can learn uh and Steph you're all that kind of bridge to that wonderful world of tour if you like to bring it into that that kind of um for the mainstream audience of the general public. I think this is what's worked really well for me with the book because it has those two aspects to it. So what a wonderful pairing. Uh, I, I wonder, Steph, I, this one last thing as well before we go on, this is a bit of a nice question as well, but I can imagine Steph then, you're there thinking, do you know what, I'm gonna ask Turi to write a book with me. Mm -hmm. How long did you have that thought in your head before you actually said, Tura, could you write a book with me? <laughs> <laughs> probably quite a long time, Andrew, probably quite a long time. Um. Uh, yeah, I, I remember that conversation, as I said, that came up during the course. So I wonder if on some level at that moment was a seed planted. Um, mm. And that was a good that was a good couple of years before that. Um, mm. And I, I think I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to even dream of writing a book if I hadn't written the first book which Turid was actually very instrumental in as well that grew out of my final project for Turid's education and it was her who said you know you should you should publish that um so I think probably the fact that I had that behind me and the fact that I knew Turid had um had liked that book probably gave me a little bit of a bit of courage to um to suggest mm -hmm. the project and you're a very good writer, Steph, so I, I like the way you're handling the language and so on. I'm a little bit more sloppy about things. Oh, you're very <laughs> kind. I don't know about that. But... 
<laughs> but if we think back then, if we start thinking about the content here, of course, the, one of the big gifts from you, to, from you to it, uh, is we went through a period where there was a lot of talk, a lot of the stuff that was out there content wise was how to get dogs to do stuff uh, and what mm. dogs are and who, what they need. Mm. But what hadn't happened really until you, and especially with your, with your book on, on talking terms, you were like, well, okay, that's all great, but who's actually stopped to ask the dog? Who's actually giving the dog a chance to say what it is they're experiencing, what it is they might need? And I think that was the big shift there. When you first came up with the book, Turid, that the original book there, and you put that out, um, what was your own motivation here? What was the thing for you? We you already brought up with that connective, that natural element of connecting to nature and, and specifically to dogs around you? Was there a dog that inspired you? Or was there somebody in your life who inspired you to look at things in a different way? Uh, I think it's uh, quite a bit more simple than that because uh, I am a, a person who is bored and observer. I, I think everybody who knows me can uh, sign that I'm an extreme observer. I see everything and uh, and uh, I did that. I was observing animals from I was a toddler and uh, has been doing that all my life. And I, I could see how they, instead of doing things with animals, I like just to observe them and see what they did naturally, what was their way of, of uh, behaving and dealing with each other and the world around. And that was so natural for me that uh, when I uh, was uh, adult and started to, to work uh, w with, uh, with dogs, well, first uh, horses actually, and then dogs, I, I must say that it was just uh, as a kind of uh, uh, ending the whole process, been observing them all my life and just starting to use it and, and uh, tell people about what I saw because I realized then that people did not see what I saw. They didn't understand, they didn't observe. So uh, most people have to learn to observe. And I, I think that is uh, the whole uh, thing around it. So the book was in a way, the end of a long process where I saw things and in the end uh, started to do something about it. And I think it's really interesting how often people will read a book like that or they will learn about body language and they learn that kind of knowledge, if you like, but then throw it out the window when they go back to just focusing mm -hmm. in on their offer and talk it again. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th this is the difference between what I see as task and care. They're very stuck in task, which is I'm going to get the mm -hmm. job to be obedient or compliant or whatever it is. Um, yeah, yeah, and this yeah. thing about observations is everything, isn't it, really? Being available to try and learn the truth of another, whether that's a human, an animal, doesn't really matter, but learning good observations, uh, we don't have enough education, I don't think, to in, the, in no. the wider animal training world about no. how to do good observations. And not even in university, they learn to observe properly, which I think is sad because most people actually learn, need to learn to do it, to, to be better at it. And they mm. have to practice. So uh, during my, the educations I was running, I tried to teach people to observe. I don't know how, how successful I was with that step, but I tried <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you know what though, Torrid? The, mm. I think one of the challenges is that it's actually, when you do start to observe, it's very painful to observe because a lot of what yeah. you see isn't very pleasant. Yeah. I yeah. know at one point, my husband said to me that he hated going for walks for me, with me, because I'd be pointing <laughs> yeah. out all the dogs and I was saying, look at that poor dog in the head halter. Look at that poor dog and all his calming signs. Look at that dog in his short <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you suddenly, you suddenly can see a lot of misery. And I think it's easier for people not to observe and to, yeah. to keep going. In many ways. Yeah. It is in yeah. many ways. And I know there are numerous of people have contacted me up through the years and told me they hate me because I see so many bad things yeah. <laughs> which this, I didn't this, see before yeah. that's a really that's powerful thing that this that 
saying is it can almost be painful to observe it's, it's really powerful and and i think we all can all recognize that when that gene is at the bottle you can't unsee anymore you can't unsee mm -hmm. it so, and there isn't, yeah because of my my talent for observing and also my obsession for it if you talk about obsessions as one of the, the ones i have and i cannot help observing and that also leads into a lot of studies very distinctive small studies and i have found that using those for my students is very helpful because they have to to see details which make them better in uh, looking at the whole picture. So I have done numerous studies in my life and that is helping in many other things also. So I did a lot of studies when I was running uh, puppy classes and that led me to the fact that I shouldn't have puppy classes. It was not good for them at all. Uh, so. Uh, you have to work on these things. You have to do studies. You have to try to find better methods and ways of doing things. And that has been a kind of uh, uh, part of the observation thing. And I, I hope that I have taught my students some of the same. Looking at some of the comments in the group already, people who have been your stu uh, students of yours, I, I think we can say that is the case. And I think, when we think about good observations, it seems simple, isn't it? Okay, yeah, I know how to observe, I know how to read body language, but actually good observations are done without judgment or label. And that judgment yeah. bit is the hardest bit because we have to check our ego at the door. We have to make sure we're well-regulated ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to just allow ourselves to see what is actually happening, not our interpretation in that moment. And that can be hard to it. Uh, pardon? Well, and that can be hard, can't it? You know, for us. Oh, it can be very hard, of course. I, I'm quite used to it, so I'm quite good at it myself. But uh, yes, it is. Uh, it can be hard sometimes. Absolutely, you can't do anything. You can't say anything. You just observe. You make notes. You take down the hard facts. That's all. It can be quite hard. Absolutely. And for you, Steph, was that the big thing when you started getting your kind of education through Turid? Was that the big? first dynamic for you is about actually I'm I'm seeing things with a different pair of eyes now. Um, my English is a little bit, uh, can you please say it again? Uh, yeah, there's a question for Steph, uh, Turi, just about her, her experiences of that being a student of yours, about how um, that shift happens to see things differently, you know, when you're learning about how to do those observations. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> What shall I say, Steph, you've been a student, you can say more about that. I, I think uh, it's very hard to, to learn to do things that is not natural for you. It is. But um, I think most can learn to be good at things. Uh, maybe I'm not the best teacher. But uh, I got better through the years, and I think uh, I, I found some ways of teaching my students to be better at these things. But uh, I wish, I have a wish, and that is that many more of my students will do uh, studies and go on with things. There are not many of them who have done that. I, I miss that part. I really do. Because I cannot go on forever. And uh, I want uh, to know that there are someone uh, continuing doing it because we need it. We are not finished with the knowledge about uh, dogs yet at all. We have a lot more to learn. We have a huge amount, don't we? And I think this is what I love about looking at things through this lens because it democratizes it. And as far, and as, far as everybody has a, has a role to play in it. Uh, mm. And, um, you know, if you... If you're alive yourself, then you have a, an emotional experience of your own. So you can validate for that if nothing else. But mm -hmm. we all want to be heard, don't we? We all want to be able to tell our story and so does the dog. And I think that's very mm -hmm. important. And this mm -hmm. is really important when we think about puppies then, isn't it? Uh, this is to both of you really, because a lot of the traditional stuff when we think about puppies from an early age is about all the expectations we put onto those puppies from day one yeah. and the emphasis on them 
learning from us. So us humans have a, a big bias towards structured education. That's why we put kids through school. We go to training classes and all these kind of things. And what we have to recognize is that mother nature cares more about experimental learning and about how we learn to cope and process and all these kind of things. And we have to look at what they do in nature. And it is the way we do things and the, the, the moms, the real natural moms do it are so different. They, are, they take care, they are nurturing the, the puppies. They don't, uh, they don't uh, correct them. They are nurturing them, showing them what to do. They are good role models and they are looking after them and taking care of them as long as they are small. They are so well looked after. And we have to learn from that because we, we demand too much. I mean, you take a puppy three months old and people demand that he's been living, he's been on this earth for three months and I demand him to do everything and be obedient, nice and well-behaved. How on earth is that possible? Exactly, and I think there's a quote I said to you, Steph, uh, which I think sums up the book in a way, uh, from Jerry Lee Kroll, um, who's a clinical social worker, who says that, talking about children, but this applies to dogs, uh, that uh, there, is a, there is a difference between quiet and compliant, which a lot of traditional dog training is about, getting compliance, and actually supporting an animal, or, or child in that case, but an animal who's calm, truly calm and well-regulated. And that ability mm -hmm. to be well regulated comes from us providing a safe environment for them to learn things in more of a natural way. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the book really focuses on that, doesn't it, Steph? We've got quite a few things uh, in the book um, that are very different in this book, Steph, that you probably wouldn't find in, in other puppy training books. Everything has its place, of course, you know, and I think, uh, you know, if you want to teach your dog something then some of the training manuals give you the opportunity to learn how to do that and to do that kindly but this is more about nurturing isn't it Steph this is more yeah. about parenting really if you like yeah, that yeah it is puppy. it is parenting and I mean it, learning good habits learning how to cope with life and everything comes little by little as I grow up it's a process it's a development and it cannot be done in just a few weeks when they are young. That is so, to me, it is an impossible thought, mm -hmm. totally. But you know, it's only a hundred years ago when they put up these regimes for kids also. They were going to be potty trained at certain hours and they were eating at certain hours and it has to be on the spot. They were awake and sleep and eat and pot, potty and whatever they do. And it turned out in the end that it was really bad for the kids. Mm. They got trauma, traumas out of it. And there's and a lot of, yeah. I was just going to say, I think, you know, the important point is that there is there is a time for everything. But I think one thing you both know that I've recently had a human baby. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it's it's really brought it home to me how when you have a baby animal, they really have to dictate the terms. They really do. Um, and that, you know, in, in time, we will teach our human baby things. But for now, it's it's not about that. And I think it's, it's yeah. the same with puppies. When they're little, oh, you have to get them what they need. Yeah. And when they're yeah. older, maybe they can do a little bit of what you want. But when they're puppies, it should be about giving them what they need. But isn't your baby well behaved and obedient now? <laughs> He's very obedient, very obedient. Oh no, wait, it's me. I'm the obedient one. I do what I'm told yeah, by the that's baby. Right. That's right. This, yeah. this, is, this is an important point you make there, Steph, because there is a huge difference between what we are taught and what we learn. Mm. And one of the most important things that we need to learn, our puppies need to learn in that crucial kind of first 12 months or so is to learn that they can feel safe and learn that they can feel safe mm -hmm. with us to feel to learn that they can whatever communication they choose they can still feel safe to do it and whatever happens when they are dysregulating 
that they have that safe anchor to come back to. This, this comes to a lot of stuff that we think about with attachment theory and that kind of thing. And, um, and I think that's, there's a lot of crossovers here between the progressive side of um, child educational psychology and development and what you're putting across in the book here, Steph. Yeah, uh, there's uh, one thing I have to tell when I have talks about this uh, everywhere. There are a couple of things I usually like to come forward with. And one thing is I was listening to a child psychologist talk once and he said something that I realized I was doing with puppies already, but it really made me very conscious about it. And that is, if you have a child, if you can make that child getting many different stimuli in, in life, but in so small portions that the child can cope with it and actually learn from it, but in many different ways. He should learn about many different things in life. When he reaches the age of nine or 10 years old, he is vaccinated against calamities in life. And I love that word. I think I've told the, my students that many times, vaccinated against calamities. And that's what we have to do with puppies as well. Little by little, they have to learn about the world, but not in bigger doses that they can actually digest it and cope with it and learn from it. This is why it's so important to learn from the puppy first. How do they need to process the environment yeah. to, feel, to, feel, to feel safe? In, in what increments can they take on a bit more? And this comes back to this difference I was talking about a minute between, between getting a dog just to be compliant or getting a dog to become well regulated like you say so they are vaccinated if you like against those kind of things as they get older um uh steph with um when we think about some of the main areas uh the book really focuses in on this notion of kind of safety first this notion of providing that dog the opportunities to feel safe the amazing rachel leather who, who specializes in trauma um, tells us that you can't train safety you have to feel it and, yeah. and all those kind of things we're doing right from an early age and um, uh, and a lot of the perceived wisdoms about puppies whether that's from the training point of view or what the general public think they need to do we're now kind of realizing it's the opposite that we need <laughs> to think about stuff isn't it when we think about we'll touch on some of these things today about crates and play fetch and dog parks and all these kind of different things and uh, and um, you know a lot of people are told, aren't they, to you know, bring the puppy home, put it in a crate, keep it in the room where you want them to be able to stay and then let them cry out, all these kind of things that we hear. Let's go through some of that with us, Steph, about some of those early connective things that we can do in order to keep that puppy to feel safe, invite the puppy to feel safe. Nobody will ever feel safe in a closed up little uh, area. Nobody, because they have no emergency exit. They, have, uh, they cannot get out of it if they want. And we know now from a brain uh, scientist that the only way for, uh, for animals to learn to cope and, uh, and get over fear is to have choices. In a the crate, they have no choices. They are, they are in a small area where they can hardly move. And besides all that, it's physically dangerous to them because uh, they cannot move as much freely as they need to because of the joints and muscles and everything. And I can see on, an, on a young dog if it's been in a crate or not, because you can see the, may, the way it moves. And they're it's on their own. They're on their own. That's even worse. That's what I find the worst thing about it. When you see puppies when they're with their mums and they're with their siblings and they're all together and they're nice and warm and cozy and then people take them home to this sterile little cage and they put them in there in their own and they must be so scared and so they it's... are build on that and, a bit then steph because um that that brings us into social sleeping steph you've got a whole section in the book on social sleeping and about um you know connection and, and where we should have the puppy can you go through some of that for us steph this is the social sleeping aspect. 
Yeah, and, and also, you know, the kind of um, how important it is to kind of have the puppy close to us when they first come home and, and all those aspects. Yeah, and I suppose just one thing on that that's really struck me now, again, as a, as a new parent, the thought of someone taking my baby away and leaving them to become distressed is a really upsetting thought mm -hmm. as, as a parent. Mm -hmm. I think it really brings home that. Um, but I think in terms of the social sleeping, I think... Again, as Tour had said, you've got to look how the mothers do it in the wild and they're not left alone. They're not no, left alone to become upset. They've got a whole network of carers looking after them. Um that's that's what their little brains expect. That's what they that's what they need. Um, that's what they've evolved to to live with. So I've seen that. quite a few of these um, films that they have made from National Geographic about when they have been filming wild uh, animals, and they never leave the puppies. There's always one staying back looking after them, always one to be a, a babysitter. And they start only to, to go by themselves when they feel okay with it themselves not being pushed to it by anybody else mm. Mm. and it's interesting isn't it how a lot of advice a lot of the more traditional advice is well you've got to get the dog to be used to being left on their own you've got to get the dog used to different things and the brain isn't ready for that yet you know with molly we didn't start leaving her at all i had to take a lot of time off work my, you know, my husband works as well so we had to make sure somebody was here with her all the time and it was probably seven or eight months before we started to build up some incremental absences for her um and interestingly on what the point you made a minute ago to it i shared a post going back a while i put it into into your daughter linda's um say no ditch the crates group i think it's called because um at, even at that age about six or seven months whenever it was that we were starting to do that. We got our video cameras everywhere, right? Because we were like, I've got to make sure we've got cameras on everything. Mm -hmm. um, in, and I shared these images from the camera and the timestamp showed that Molly had moved five times in a 15 minute window, mm -hmm. Com like completely changed position, changed location mm -hmm. within the yep. safe space that we provided for her. So it's a safe space. It wasn't the run of the whole house. And I think that's, that shows that aspect to her she needed to move she had to get up and move again and go and move somewhere else whether that's for safety whether that's for comfort and that is also has to do with the physical part of it because they need to move a lot even as they are growing up to to get healthy joints and healthy a healthy body well balanced need to to move a lot not being exercised but free the way they feel themselves. And that doesn't mean uh, doing something for half an hour or one hour at a time. They move a little. Like when we, when I go to the physiotherapist, I'm going to do some exercise five times, not more. Don't overdo things five times. Then we do something mm -hmm. else five times. So everything is uh, in small portions to get a better and healthier body. And actually, I think it's important when we think about the developmental side of things, because this brings us on to this wonderful word. And I'm going to I'm going to say it wrong now, uh, Turi, but sound fairing. Is that right? Sound fairing. Is that have I pronounced that right? <laughs> so, sound fighting. It's, a, it's a Norwegian word. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe I shouldn't have brought it into <laughs> I love it. Me and Steph <laughs> love it. We're going to get a T-shirt done with it. We loved it. It's just, got, it's just I, a great I, word. I love it. And I learned it when I went uh, to this military course, uh, of, uh, trying to learn about horses. We had uh, two hours with a veterinarian every day for many months. And he used the word sound fighting and I loved it. <laughs> so I just went on using it. It means uh, sound fighting literally means going by the seams you know, going to see the details. And that is when you touch a dog and feel the whole dog with your hands, your flat hands to feel how it is. And it's so easy to feel where there are tension, where there are hot spots, cold spots, where there is something irregular that you have to look at. And it's really important. And this fits with what you're saying there, because 
dogs are changing neurologically, physiologically so much and mm. so rapidly. You know, with Molly, I've got a, an amazing physio friend uh, and we, uh, she saw Molly about three or four times in that first 12 months because I just wanted her to see how she was developing. And this comes back to this thing about trying to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support that healthy development. And one of the most important things is that they are not born complete. They are born incomplete totally. Uh, uh, joints, muscles, brain, there's a lot of things that need to be developed uh, the next uh, one and a half year. <laughs> up to two years and uh, the joints are not uh, together they are not uh, a joint what you call it step when the joints are not uh, they are just apart so when they they move or they sit they, they just uh, slide around in the sockets <coughs> that means that they when you see young dogs move you see the hind legs they are uh, not uh, in balance and they are going everywhere and that's because the joints are not fully developed yet and that means we have to be careful because it is painful and it can destroy the the joints uh, if you if you are doing a lot of sits and down and walking them on a leash to straight forward and so on they cannot take it they get uh, they need to move more freely so they, when they start to feel pain, they can stop it and do something else. And we know, of course, even with humans, we have developed, we have kind of growing pains through, especially through our kind of uh, that yep. mid range of our teen times, uh, and that's condensed even more down for, for doggies. And this brings us on to a, another point in the book, which is really powerful uh, as well, about not playing fetch uh you know um and, mm. and because a lot of people again they have the young puppies you just said it there Turid. you know we owe every young dog that first two years that first two years to get them to some form of behavioral maturity physically emotionally mentally and yet the general public seem to think that that's just that you know go to some puppy classes throw the dog mm. balls get the dog tied out and that's all we need to do and and we're not equipping that dog physically or emotionally to have the resilience they need to deal with everyday life a lot of the time. So let's talk about I, I think it. I think it's really scary to see because I always count things and I make statistics out of everything. So recently I started to, to put down on paper uh, what I saw in different dogs I, I was uh, looking at. And nine out of 10 adult dogs today they have some uh, uh, physical problem because of wrong or too much or too fast or something wrong exercise when they were young. The joints have been growing, developing wrongly. They have all kinds of unbalanced uh, problems. And of course, when they have pain, they get problems. Also, I think going through adolescence, when we think that the adolescent brain is designed to dysregulate anyway, so it doesn't take much elevation to get them into that state where they're not mm. particularly present. When we think about those pain and especially some of the chronic stuff, some of the stuff that might be just going through a phase of feeling uncomfortable, it also affects their ability to do the learning and to connect to us. And, and mm. then we're putting a lot more pressure on them because we're wanting them to be obedient and compliant. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, oh. Steph, were you going to come in there, Steph? I, I was just going to say, I remember once actually um, hearing Amber Batson make a very um, relevant point about this and how, I suppose, how that behavior, that sort of chase behavior manifests in real life and how we totally overdo it when we're with dogs. That if they're in the wild, they mm. might see one rabbit and chase the rabbit and then there's downtime. Then there's time for them to either eat the rabbit if they've caught it or there's time when there's nothing happening. But when mm. people throw balls, they never just throw the ball once. They throw the ball 10, 20, 30 times. Mm. And it's a really, it's a really extreme um, application of a behavior that would happen very rarely, naturally for the dog. It's totally it's very dog. unnatural. Yeah. yeah. It is. And also... If you think about the dog in that in those formative months, and you said about this early, you know, that 
a dog is six or seven months, they've hardly been on the planet, right? They've got loads to learn, loads to process. If their only experience of the outside world is being in an elevated state chasing balls, when are they learning to safely socially process or process the environment or to be able to take things into that long term memory so they can they can do that kind of um, uh, you know good information for that cognitive appraisal that they have to do. So there's a lot of factors to balls, I think, that that we need to consider, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And there can be lots of side effects as well that people, even if they didn't mind the sort of the things we're talking about you see so many dogs who then become really obsessive about all balls and they're having fights with other dogs in the park because the other dog has a ball and they want it or so even even if people aren't worried about the things that we mention in the book in terms of the impact on the body and the stress just behaviorally for the owners for the humans yeah. there's lots of unwanted <laughs> behavior that can stem from it yeah well, I'm, I'm, one of the arguments they come with is that yes, but it's so natural for dogs to do uh, to do hunting behavior. It's not because most of the hunting behavior is sniffing, searching, uh, using concentrated, slow work to find food. The chase is just uh, maybe uh, one thousand part of uh, of uh, the hunting at all. They don't need that. If they have all the other hunting uh, things like uh, tracking, uh, searching, finding, th that's the best. And that is much more uh, natural for them and much healthier for body and soul and everything. That's interesting because there's a big part in the book that really focuses in on that natural connection to the environment especially olfactorily especially through sniffing and giving more time and slowing things down to let dogs use their nose more because a lot of the traditional things that we think about with puppy training is the opposite it's hear this look at that you know because we're using a lot of verbal cues or a lot of you know things to look at and we're, we're taking away those opportunities to sniff first and um we had a situation recently where molly met a horse for the first time and it was interesting to see the first thing she did was air scent and sniff it. And I thought, yeah, cool. She's learned. She has the time to process first. And I think this is that thing we talked about earlier, the difference between what we're taught and what we learn. Uh, it's important. The two most important things I wanted Molly to learn was that she could feel safe and she has time to process things on her terms. Mm -hmm. And that's important, Steph, isn't it? When we think about the nose side of things and how important that nose is for regulation, actually, Steph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even, I, I mean, I'll come on to that in a second, but even just in terms of all of their senses, people are very quick to deprive them. I know when I'm running puppy classes, one common complaint people have is that the puppy won't move, that the puppy wants to sit down on walks. And of course mm -hmm. they want to sit down. They want to look around even before we get mm -hmm. the sniffing. They want to yeah. see what's happening in the world around them and they want to hear yeah. what's happening. And of course... Uh, they do, yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing how few people have time to let them look. If yeah. they look at something, they have to get the dog to look at them instead. Why? Let yeah. the dog look. Yeah. That's so good for them. They learn about it. They take in the world through the, all the senses and mm -hmm. also the eyes, of course. Yeah. So then, and then the nose, then I suppose it's one that people don't always think about because we're not very focused on smells. Um, yeah. And I'm I'm always reminding people that that the dogs are and the puppies are seeing the world through their nose, and that's that's what they really want to do, and it has that calming effect for them when they're sniffing. It calms them. Yeah, and also them. it it has other good effects because they actually learn to concentrate that mm -hmm. way, and we need dogs to be able to concentrate them uh, many times. Yeah. Many adult yeah. dogs are not good at it at all because they never did it. Yeah. And I often encourage people with, with their puppies when they're doing treat searches, I say to them, look, don't worry if the first time the puppy only does it for 10 seconds, keep mm. doing it, do it every day. And you can actually watch their mm. concentration and their focus grow and increase. Um, we, and we had a young dog for that uh, treat search uh, not so long ago, and he was able to concentrate for, I think, two seconds at yeah. the time. <laughs> and I mean, okay, so then let him do it for two seconds then and try again 
and let him have time. Don't disturb him. Don't um, take him out of it. Don't do anything to disturb what he's doing. He will learn to concentrate more. Yeah. And the other thing actually we did, it's not, it was more of a young dog issue, but when I had a client who had a dog and she came to me in the beginning and she said, I know I did everything wrong when the dog was a puppy. I let him play with every dog he met and, you know, it was all too fast. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was asking her to do was, was the treat searches. And she said, oh no, he can't do it. He can't focus. And, but when we went to do some parallel walking with mm -hmm. other dogs, when he saw the other two dogs head down and do the sniff, he was great at sniffing. He was copying them and he was doing it. Yeah. And he was absolutely yeah. fine. He didn't have any issue. <laughs> but she was convinced yeah. he didn't have the focus to do it, but he did. Yeah. And they, that's also one of the reasons why they need to have some older dogs around them when they grow up. They, they need role models to, to copy, mm. just like kids copy us. Because that's a really important point, isn't it? Because social learning, we've seen it with Molly. So the thing with social learning for me is Molly, um, you know, my other two dogs are quite well regulated, which helps. And Molly was in a nicely regulated state when she was doing, when we saw a lot of the social learning, all of those nervous systems were in a nice place. Mm. When we think about a lot of the, the activities that dogs get with other dogs, if you don't have other dogs in the home, especially older dogs is, they have it on the beach or in the dog park where lots of dysregulated dogs running around, not doing social mm. processing fully, uh, not looking at the little bits of social etiquette that um, a mm. better regulated dog might do. And it can be quite difficult for these young dogs then to actually, again, have the time to be able to do things in a moderated way. Mm -hmm. We try to put uh, together two and two dogs uh, and make them take walks together because we cannot always be with them. So we want them to do it themselves. And the ones who have started to do it, it is, goes so well. And mm. it has such a wonderful effect on the dogs when they have someone else to walk quietly with and not run around with, but had time to look at each other, do calm, nice things together. It's amazing what an effect it has. This touches on a little bit then, Steph, about dog parks that you talk about in the book. Yeah. Um, expand on the kind of considerations we have to think about. And obviously, we don't have dog parks so much in the UK, but like I live on a beach here, so the, the beach is a dog park, really. It's just everybody mm -hmm. comes down here and lets the dogs on the beach and, and that kind of thing. So just expand on that a little bit for us, Steph. Well, I have to say, I think dog parks are one of my 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 biggest hates in the dog world. <laughs> and there's a few things that I hate about them. One is that I think they really do encourage dogs to interact in that really high octave manic play. And for a lot of dogs, that's then making up the majority of their interaction with other dogs. So from a young age, what they're learning is that other dogs mean lots of really exciting play. So as well as the fact that it's encouraging them to tear up to every dog they see and to be really rude and obnoxious, it also means that the recall goes out the window because the dogs see another dog and they couldn't give a damn what you're doing because they're so excited at the sight of another dog. But for puppies, we we live very near a, a general park and within it, there is um, a puppy park. And I was walking past it the other day. And I saw a really classic dog park problem for puppies. There was a man in there with two little tiny teacup chihuahuas and they were terrified of all these other dogs running up to them. Mm. And the other dogs would run up to them and the chihuahuas would sort of cower and then bark and then cower. Um, and every time they barked, the man was saying to them, no, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. And I could hear <laughs> people saying to the man, isn't it great for them to learn this way? Isn't it great for them to be having these social experiences? And I was saying to my husband, all he's teaching those dogs is to be afraid of other dogs. <laughs> yeah, and, and on the other hand, they also teach dogs to be bullies. To be bullies, Because yeah. some of them will be bullies and they will continue being bullies. Mm. And that's not nice either. Yeah. So and, uh, and the, you have and, both. Yeah. And the extra level to that is how often do when we work with clients and their dog is that dog that, well, my dog's having a great time on the beach. They love it. And then when we go and see it, a lot of the time, the client, the, the owners think the dogs are loving that experience because the dogs are all legging it around and 
Uh, and in fact, we just got a lot of dogs who are in, in, engaging in boisterous elevated play because that nervous system's out through the roof. They're mm -hmm. not actually learning the nuances. And it's very yeah. hard when you have a socially sensitive dog. So we learned from Molly early on. Molly came to us at 16 weeks. She'd had two homes already. Uh, she was a big puppy biter. Puppies bite anyway, we know, but she did that kind of very high elevated stress one. And that was because of all the social pressure she felt a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So taking Molly out, who was clearly socially sensitive, when everybody wants to come and touch her, uh, and people don't even ask, right? It's like, puppy, oh my God. And then trying to find places and spaces where she could, you know, explore and, and like I say, see the world and sniff the world without being mm. mobbed by all these dogs who just want to kind of invade her space. It's hard. It can be hard sometimes. Mm. I must say that a lot of my uh, previous students and maybe some others also, of course, uh, have started now to to put up dog parks that are totally different from these uh, running around uh, parks at all. And uh, in many different countries. I don't know if they are in England at all yet, but uh, I see they're popping up here several places. We went to look at a place today where they're going to put up one. Uh, it will be safe. It will be only for one dog at a time or uh, a couple of dogs who know each other very well. So it will not be all this running around. And I think that kind of uh, uh, parks will be the future if you really want to take care of the dogs. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, brilliant. And I think uh, when we think about the um the pressures on that young dog you know I, I get again just going back to molly she's she's about 13 months now 14 months it's just no time to be on the planet there's so many things to have to kind of deal with and i think the problem for me is it's almost an apology really to the general public because many in the general public because of the explosion of dog training which over here in the UK, really only started in the kind of late 70s, early 80s. When I was young, uh, we had Barbara Woodhouse on the telly and that was about it. Nobody really did a lot of stuff. But the general public now, I think, have been convinced that the most important thing is a well-trained, well -trained, obedient dog. Mm. And the thing that's happened there is the dog's ability to communicate need or to communicate extra support is now deemed to be a training issue. So we've got the general public who know how to teach sit, but they don't know what pain looks like. They don't know what stress looks like. They don't know how to read that dog's body language. They don't know that that dog might need more time to decompress. They don't do things slow enough for the dog. Everything's done at such a yeah. speed and it's a problem. And I think it's a big lack of awareness problem, which yeah. obviously your book is going to help to address a little bit. Um, unfortunately, it is mostly because they have turned to be so many dog clubs and dog training classes run. And they, uh, they have instructors who don't know enough about uh, what they are doing. They can do a lot of good things and they, they can probably make dogs sit and do this and do that. But it doesn't help if you cannot understand their need for social behavior, learning to cope with the world, uh, be in balance. Uh, and so on. And uh, we, we need to have better education for ordinary instructors. And uh, we, have to, we have to stop all this competition because competition is really ruining a lot of dogs. They are pushed to get prizes because uh, the people like to get prizes. And uh, the dogs are not competitive that way. They do it for us. They don't do it to be competitive. And this is a big point here because um, the, the amazing Mandy, uh, uh, who's uh, our um, one of the moderators in the group as well, gave a great talk. Mandy's is um, uh, Mandy Wilson has got a big history in human education mm. and the challenges between the difference between attainment and achievement. And we've brought this into dogs, really. We put a huge emphasis on attainment, the attainment of these things, mm -hmm. rather than championing and celebrating achievement. So for some of my clients, the fact that they were in that village hall in the first place is an achievement. 
the fact they mm -hmm. then can't necessarily be able to tick some boxes on a uh, you know whatever it is or be able to run that thing in a certain time or do whatever the fact they weren't able to do the attainment shouldn't matter so much I think that you know we've got to find things also that the dog seems to want to do you know Molly's at the age now where we're trialing a few different activities to see what she instinctively likes to do because mm -hmm. it's very hard when you start kind of getting the dog to do it and using a lot of food to encourage the dog to do it and then you think oh my god my dog loves it well do they or do they just love the fact that they're doing the trick? Yeah. So, so you know, Molly, mm. In the first place, I always say that teach dogs to do some uh, some uh, practical things that has value for you and the dog. Like let the dog uh, bring something to you. And they will like to do that. They will like to do have some small tasks in daily life. If you really want them to do something, go and pick up the mail or bring something to go to. Steph could teach uh, the dogs to go to Tom and uh, give give him some messages, put on the teapot or something. <laughs> <laughs> Come and take this baby away. <laughs> and you know, I could have done that. I could have that when I didn't have my voice, Steph. I could have trained my yeah. dogs to communicate to my husband for me. That would have been handy. <laughs> yeah. And that's a great thing because then they feel they do something valuable. They do something for you and that's what they really want. They are pack animals. They want to do something for each other and together with each other. So I, I always like those things best. And we are not very competitive, are we, Steph? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we can say that very honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, neither of my dogs are very obliging at all. Neither of them can do anything for me. So I wouldn't want to be competitive. They'd be letting me down terribly if I was. <laughs> I think this, this, what you're saying then really is, um, if we slow things down, if we see everything as a request rather than a command, it's a request. Mm -hmm. And if we wait for the feedback from our dogs, we can't go too far wrong, really, if we're like, yeah, yeah and I think that feedback is important. I, I, and uh, we can do things. There's a saying which is um, coercion is often paved with good intention. And I think that's quite powerful, really, because, uh, you know, uh, for example, when I was growing up, my parents decided that I was going to play the piano. So they bought me a piano and they gave me lessons and I play the piano, which is great. But what they didn't do was wait for any feedback or even ask me because they didn't see me in the garden with my with my tennis racket pretending to be Eric Clapton because I always wanted to play the guitar. <laughs> but my parents never asked me or never, you know, they just already decided, wouldn't it be great? And a lot of the decisions we make for our dogs, we do it because we love them and we want to have a great time. But sometimes maybe we should just step back and think, I wonder if this is right for them. And I we, need to listen. we need to listen to them, hmm. definitely. I, I, when I had the farm, and my two grandchildren uh, uh, grew up in that house with four dogs and 14 cats and God knows what, all kinds of animals. <laughs> creatures of all kinds. So uh, we had a full house of animals and I was very, very keen on that they should uh, be, learn to be nice to, to animals. So I taught them from they were two years old, instead of saying move or something to the dog, say, could you please? Mm -hmm. And when they were two and a half, they actually did it, mm -hmm. and I was so happy. They would never push a dog away. They, they would say, could you please move? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we have to, maybe not that extreme, maybe you don't have it to do it that, that way, but the idea of making them ask the dog nicely, be polite to the dog, I think that's important. And this is another fallout from the general public being almost kind of convinced that obedience is most important, because if you ask the dog to do something there, do it, it's an obedience issue, rather mm -hmm. than recognizing that maybe the dog can't process that right now, maybe they physically can't do it right now, maybe they're not in the right headspace right now. Um, I've, I've heard it totally uh, and uh, 
well, it's nothing I, I, I feel like at all. The, the last dogs I had, the three, four last dogs I had, they didn't know one obedience word. None of them learned to sit or lie down or heal or anything like that. I didn't even teach them to come because I, I knew that if I turned and made a few steps the other way, they would come. And they could choose if they would sit or stand or lie. That was totally up to them. Couldn't care less. If you have a dog beside you, what's the point? Why should the dog sit? It can do whatever he wants, just like us. Sometimes we want to stand, sometimes we want to sit down. And you know, I was in my local vets recently and the lady was in there with her dog who was already very nervous. She got the dog onto the weighing scales and she was still asking for a sit. And I was thinking, you know, that's just when we get in that mind step, don't we? you must sit now without thinking, oh my God, isn't it amazing my dog's even in here? And isn't it amazing my dog stood on it? Because mm -hmm. actually what we want is the dog's weight, but the lady was like, sit, sit, and just adding these extra bits of stress in. And, and it can happen very easily if we, be, if we get kind of indoctrinated into that mindset. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, okay, so <laughs> this has been amazing. We've covered a lot of stuff here and, and some of it I think just needs to be talked about. I think we just need to break these taboos and, and it isn't about rights and wrongs necessarily. It's just a case of we've done the how very well. You know, how do we get dogs to do stuff? How do we do training? How do we utilize that? This is about the why really. And, and I think it would be a shame if the move to positive reinforcement was the end of the story. And I think it isn't, it's just the foundation for us to think more about how do we become more available to that individual dog and their story and their truth, if you like, and what it is that we can do so that we can mm -hmm. coexist well and we can have a partnership and we can think about these things. And they are like so into becoming partners. It is so much in the genetical order to be partners with the ones they live together with. It's so easy to have a good relationship to a dog. It's so easy. And you know what I learned from my last dog? She was, and it wasn't anything I did. She came to me when she was three, toured new Fia. She was a very calm, reasonably confident dog. And because she was like that, I actually never had to teach her anything. I could bring her anywhere. And I never had to teach her anything. And it was good because she wasn't really open to learning anything. <laughs> but she was, she was calm and she was confident and she was quite happy. And it really brought home to me that that is actually all you need for an easy life with your yeah. dog. Yeah. And the big thing to do then is when, when you get a puppy and you have that opportunity is to create that calm, confident dog. And then your life will be so easy. You'll never have to do anything. You won't have to spend all those hours training and, you know, teaching them this, that and the other, because they'll just they'll just slot in with your life and you'll slot in with their life and everyone will be happy and will be equal partners. Um, and that's and they always seem really to do the right thing. They always seem to be right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And also something you said there is, is very, really important because I often think when I think about what we've done with Molly, I and mean, you have to be careful because it's it's only Molly's story, and I get that because this is Molly's story, and it might be different for another dog. But how much of the things that we do in a more traditional way, and those expectations that are quite unrealistic on that puppy, create the issues like pulling, jumping up, whatever? Mm -hmm. We then think, oh no, we've got we've got to do the training to now stop it. Whereas in fact, if the dog with Molly, we've never taught her to do loose leash walking because we haven't had to, because from an early age, we gave her, we we found the right environments to allow her to mooch and either be on a long line or to be on off leash. Mm -hmm. So now she goes into the environment. And if I do feel that tension through the leash or that bit of pulling, I know she's elevating. Uh, she does we've not had to teach her not to jump up because she knows she has the time to be able to process without people putting social pressure on her, where a lot of the jumping up was coming from, things like that stuff. I think it's interesting if we start thinking about things differently, how a lot of the things that we presume are important training things to do, we wouldn't have to do it in the first place because you've kind of just alluded to that there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I and one, of the, one of the things I struggle most with to teach my clients is 
to have a little patience because I want things to happen now. The dog should come now, he should turn and go that way because I want it now. He should go away from that now. Not because they are particularly keen on obedience or anything, but they think that it has to happen. Something has to happen all the time. Mm -hmm. And I really struggle to say, stand still, don't say anything. Yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. <laughs> I said, Sorry. just stand still, wait, wait. wait. You don't say, don't say anything. You say, stand still and shut up. <laughs> Remember, you're telling us all to shut up. <laughs> so, so we end up with very compliant owners, uh, but dogs who can have a bit of time out, which is good. Maybe that's the right way around. Maybe that's the way we need to go. Yeah. I, I'm and nice I, with dogs, but not with people. That's <laughs> how it is. <laughs> um, somebody said to me once, if, uh, if, um, uh, if two of was to say sit, everybody would sit. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know that's fair or not, but, but I think that's good. I and mean, that's that's what it's about. But and so this is important, isn't it? And I think um the uh I hear a lot, I get a lot of people in my in, in my kind of mailbag, people who've heard some of the educational stuff I do, not on the level you do, uh Tyrion, of course, but I just talk about the emotional experience a lot because we all have one and they're all unique to us. And that's for me is the lens we have to think about. There's a lot of trainers who get in touch who hear this and they're like, do you know, I want to do things differently, but it's a bit scary because I feel an expectation from the mm. general public that they 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 can expect me to have to do sit down, come stay. But amazing colleagues like Helen Moore, Lucy Olders, Matt Donovan, lots of other people that are listening in um, are already doing it differently. And, and the response is this. How do we know what their expectations? Who says we have to do classes like that? Actually, when people come along, we can easily, what they want to do is that they want to be able to connect to their puppies better. They want a puppy who is more connected, a puppy who, you know, is able to, like you said, Steph, regulate themselves ultimately, because that's going to be the, that's the gold standard, right? So actually, I think we need to be braver and think, well, actually, that person's come along because I've got something to share with them. And um, all these amazing trainers who are doing classes differently, they all say that people really love them because guess what? It's easier because <laughs> they're not yeah. having to go home thinking, I've got to spend two hours this week trying to tra train this. Mm -hmm. or I've got to spend three hours or, you know, because it's actually about, you know, isn't it amazing how your dog just did that and look at that. And if you do this, the dog will follow you and all these kind of things that are more instinctive and natural. And it's easier, actually. Mm -hmm. It is. And actually, I had a similar experience, Andrew, last week in one. I had a first week of a little puppy course. Um, and like that, the focus was on just the dogs being together. We were doing lots of walk, just cam walking together and little sniffing games. And at the end of the class, one of the women said to me, it's great. I've never seen him this cam around other dogs before. It was just having that social experience and to see the dog go from arriving and being like, oh, my God, other dogs to just kind mm. of mooching and sniffing. And she was she was really pleased with that. Mm -hmm. And also, that was how I changed the classes many years ago when I started my own school. And everybody says that, oh, I have to teach uh, the dogs to sit and lie and oh, oh, because that's what people expect. Forget about that, do it your own way. When people came, I started doing something that was interesting and fun and people forgot all about what they really expected and they were so happy about it i never heard anybody ask for when do we teach the dogs to sit mm. they never talked about it because there were so many interesting things to look at and do and also tourid by the time they come to puppy class they've all already taught their puppies to sit that's the other <laughs> that's problem that's true that is so true and uh... many many times yes yes <laughs> And also anything we do want to teach, the brain and the dog has to be in a good learning space. Yeah. And that is better when they're better regulated, actually. And, and uh, you know, um, well, this has been amazing. So I've got a couple of questions that I've written down here that I've seen in the group. Any other questions you want to ask now is the time, guys. Bung them in. Try and keep them short, please, because I'll lose them in the thread. Before I ask these, a little question and um, my voice is going a little bit again sorry about that um i'd like you to think about what if you could send me if i was to say to you right uh i want you to let me know something from the book that you think i should know 
you know, if I if I wasn't able to get the book for some reason, you were just going to send me a, a chapter or send me a few pages. What is it that if somebody had this book, you really want them to take away? That can be a specific thing or it can be just a general philosophy or ideology from the book. Steph, you first. Thanks, Andrew, for putting me on the spot there. <laughs> but no, I think for me, the big thing is that dogs and puppies are social creatures before anything else. They are social creatures. And I think what most people are not giving enough of to their puppies is their their, their presence and their time. And if mm. I suppose if I could just ask people to do one thing for their puppies, it would just be to be with them. Just be with them and be there and be present. And mm. that I think for me is probably the main thing. Don't lock them in a cage. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. really powerful because I, I wrote a piece recently for a, a newspaper article and the thing that they chose out of my piece to put at the top as a tagline was that the dog knows the quality of your presence and I think that's never more powerful when they're puppies right mm -hmm. how what is that what quality do we give them for them to be aware of us and and I think that's really powerful thank you Steph Turid you next darling yeah, uh, I, I think I would probably say some of the same, or maybe um, uh, the fact that we have to remember that puppies look upon us as kind of role models, because they don't have other role models around usually. And what we have to think about what we do. If we want a, a screwed up dog, we run around and ask them to do things and activate them and do things and talk to them and yell at them and all kinds of things. And they will become like that. Mm -hmm. If we want a calm dog, we do calm things. We, If we want the dog to settle down, we just sit down. We don't ask them to lie down. We just sit down ourselves and they will lie down because what we do, they will do. And that is so easy. And that makes life so easy from the beginning. If you just think about what we do, the dog will actually copy. And it's common sense, isn't it? Isn't it? I just think it is sometimes. And, uh, you know, um, one of my friends, she's got seven dogs, my friend, uh, and they all kind of do their own thing, the dogs. But in the afternoons, uh, we've, we, we used to have a, a show over it on, on telly over here uh called you know neighbors it's an australian thing but we had it over here as well and that my friend was obsessed with neighbors so that was her quiet time so she used to get a dining chair and plonk it in the middle of this big space with the dogs and her presence was enough for all those dogs thinking like mom's gonna concentrate mm. now we need to lie down and all yeah. the craziness of the day would go because she was just saying very clearly by sitting in the middle of that room we're going to settle down right now. So it can be very powerful sometimes. And, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, your, your daughter, Linda, talks a lot about how powerful hand signals can be. Just, yeah. just, just the hand really yeah. lets no intent. She's like, enough. Yeah. And I usually tell people that if you don't teach your dog anything else in all his life, do that. Because it will take away you yelling, talking, and do all kinds of things that can be both scary and not so nice and it's so calm it's efficient it's easy it's just great uh and i i learned a lot about hand signals when i had no voice actually because <laughs> not just for the dogs but with, with my hand with my husband as well uh <laughs> yes it can be very handy right so we got some different questions so i've written down a couple from earlier but i didn't write down the name so apologies about that and i'm gonna Maybe uh, if you have time, uh, either one of you after the event, maybe tomorrow or something, just have a look through the thread. And if there's anything you want to throw in, then please do. Um, but uh, neutering, what are our thoughts on neutering? When and should we? Any thoughts on neutering and spaying? There <laughs> might be cases where it can be done, but um. I'm against uh, things like that because it is and it has an effect on the body physically and mentally. And uh, I don't think we should fuss with it. It, it goes really well. Uh, I mean, I live in a country where most dogs are uh, not neutered. 
So uh, I, I see uh, the difference between here and many other places where they neuter or castrate everybody. It's a big difference. And I will say that I, I would choose an unneutered dog any time. And they know now for sure that they, it's not like they were thought before that they have to neuter them not to get the cancer and all kind of illnesses. It's the opposite. Mm. It really is the opposite. I think it doesn't, mm. doesn't help for uh, many things. There might be a few cases, but I won't go into that. I'm not that uh, uh, good at uh, medical things, but uh, I'm used to having a neuter dog, dogs around me and that's absolutely fine. They are much easier to, uh, to work with any day. Anything you wanted to add on neutering or spaying stuff? And again, it's not, it's not my area of expertise, but I suppose the two things that I would say on it is that I, I, what I always say to people is just wait and see, don't go in there at five months or six months and just do it for the sake of doing it, wait and see. Yeah. And, yeah. and the other thing that I have noticed is that in my own work is that the big side effect that I see, particularly with male dogs, is you get dogs who've got really really lovely temperaments and they're neutered and overnight they can become really sort of nervy and barky and yappy I've seen that a good few times now so especially when I meet people with dogs who are sort of borderline in terms of confidence and personality I would always say look just if you can hold off <laughs> but I know I know it's a very emotive subject because I know there is a problem in lots of countries with lots of unwanted puppies and I know that neutering is the most effective way of stopping that so I know it's a very emotive subject um yeah. but in, in cases where they have a lot of stray dogs I think it's necessary to do it of course sometimes mm. but, but I am I am really very skeptical uh, and, and I think there's enough evidence I think people like Amber Batson and others have shared it that at least waiting for, for that dog to have become sexually mature uh, is, is a minimum really because it makes sense when you, you know, think about it. Hmm. Uh, male dogs can be a pest and a plague at some point in in the in the young age till they are really uh, really mature and adult hmm. but uh, as I usually say what people don't like but I say it anyway it's just like young boys I can be quite uh, and uh, horrible in that way but they usually grow up and become decent men even if they're this not castrated you know, uh, because, even if they're um, not castrated I, I, I was one of those and i haven't been castrated uh, but i think this is i'll tell you a little story about andy right 14 year old andy it's a true story on the roof of a friend's garage with his mates peer group pressure telling me to jump my testosterone made it very difficult to back down. Mm. But that part of my brain that we need, that moderating part of the brain, which doesn't come online for us humans until the end of adolescence into our 20s, wasn't mm. there to say, Andy, maybe not a good idea. So I jumped off that roof and I broke my ankle. So there you go. And that's the thing about experimental learning, because Mother Nature's like, cool, you've learned something there. It didn't kill you. You've learned something. So yeah, testosterone can get us blokes into all sorts of trouble, that's for sure. But it can also mean that you turn up. And that's the thing for some of these sensitive males, of course, that is the testosterone that, that was allowing them to turn up in the first place. So it's a and it's it's, it's, it's difficult for 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 the individual to to handle mm. this in this period. Of course it is. But you just have to be patient and they grow up. They do grow up, and I think sometimes we need to think, rather than think about changing the dog, we need to think about changing the environment for a bit. Yeah, yeah. And you go through phases. We went through a phase where Molly seemed a lot more confident and able to cope. We live on a beach here. She never even saw the beach until about nine months, ten months, because it would have been too much for her. Then we went through a phase where she started to get a bit too um, overwhelmed again. So we just had to go back a bit. And, and people find that hard, don't they, going back a bit? But it's it's the easiest thing, which is like, okay, we need to just change the environment again a little bit. Further. Okay, so Trisha, hi, Trisha. Uh, um, Trisha Hollinshead, you'll know too. Oh, yeah, sure. okay. uh, can you talk a little bit about breed? 
Only a little well, bit. That's true, that's that's topic, true. But, but breed differences are important, aren't they? I think uh, breed group differences. Well, I think, I think about... it's important to know a little bit about the different breeds and especially the breed you get. You need to read a bit and learn about uh, that kind of breed because, okay, uh, although all dogs have something in common, but they have also been bred for specific work. Uh, and maybe for a long time, for hundreds of years actually, and that will affect them. So they will have some, some uh, things in them that are very breed specific. So you have to, uh, you have to know a little about it. Uh, herding dogs have some kind of uh, ways to be that is different from guarding dogs and uh, mountain guarding dogs uh, are different from the, from the the normal herding dogs and so on. Terriers have their own agenda, to be quite <laughs> honest, <laughs> and so on. So you have to learn about it because they have been bred for specific things and that is also in them. We have to know about it. Uh, so they are all have a lot of the same things. The social, the social aspect is there in all dogs hunting and guarding will be in all of them and then we have these specific things in between and that's very important especially with the adolescent dogs again they're part of the brain that they need to be able to moderate some of those responses isn't online either and a lot of those mm -hmm. those kind of um uh, kind of innate behaviors will often happen when they're in an elevated state so that, you know, and I think it's important to recognize that, especially when they're young, when they, when they have oh, yes. less kind of things. Oh, Anything yes. you want to add to, add to that, Steph? No, I have to say, I, I think I'm not, a, I don't feel I'm, I'm really good on, on dog breeds. <laughs> I think Tour is definitely the expert there. And this is where, um, you know, Kim Brophy's book, uh, Meet Your Dog, is, is a good book because it looks at all the different breeds and thinks about things like fixed action patterns or modular action patterns, you know, uh, I think these things are all very important. And like Lord, my friend Laura Donaldson said, you know, how many times have we have trainers turned up and somebody's got a particular breed that is has a particular breed need and then we're expected to somehow train out of them something that's been inherent for them for the last four or 500 years, you know? Mm -hmm. it, 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 we're setting ourselves up to quite a task, aren't we, I think? Um, okay, let's have a look here. So uh, Amy says, how does proper nurturing and being present, which is what we talked about today, fit in with normal daily life? And that's a really good question because when we think about, you know, when I think about when Molly came along, we weren't expecting Molly. She just came out of the blue. We, 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 we were after foster her and guess what we kept her but i had to i had to change i had to cancel clients i had to i had to pull out of talking at conferences and i said to kieran how do you have a puppy and both of you go off to work full time because that's what happens a lot and i think the answer is it's really hard right steph yeah and i i found the same with with having having the baby you just everything just changes you can't go out for meals you can't go out late and I suppose people ex expect that when they have a baby. But I think when people get a puppy, they often expect that life can just yeah. go on as normal. And of yeah. course, it can't. Everything changes. And yeah. I personally think, and I've actually never had a puppy for that reason. I think if you're getting a puppy, you mm. need to have the right environment and context to get it right. Um, mm. And I think... I think being prepared for that, I think, again, coming back to that social yeah. thing, I think people often don't realize that puppies really need you there. I don't think they, they, they prepare, they think more about the food bowls and, and uh, things to lie on and so on. And the more important is you cannot start leaving a puppy alone at home. He needs a, a dog sitter. Mm -hmm. He yeah. needs someone to be there for them. That's totally necessary. Like a baby, you wouldn't dream. I wouldn't dream of going out and leaving my baby at home. And you scare the hell out of puppies who, who are left alone. They, they and it, it can have effect on their their life forever after. Actually, and, and actually, I think it also has another advantage as well because with us, we we've, we've got friends and neighbours. We create a village around Molly because mm. obviously we can't be here all the time. And that was really healthy for her because she she learned. Oh, I can go to Auntie Margaret's and feel safe. I can go to Auntie Liz's and feel safe. And also this myth that if they're not left alone early on, they can't learn to be left alone. 
she she does get left alone and she's really happy to now and and we've built that up over time it's the same with the kind of bedroom thing you know when um she came in a crate and because we were fostering her we used that but as soon as we um adopted her we actually used the crate and dismantled it so it could be part of a pen right next to me in the in the bedroom mm -hmm. then when she was a bit older she started sleeping on the bed and again people might think oh that means she'll always sleep on the bed but you know what she doesn't now she's at the age where she's like I'm going to go and find my own bed where it's more comfortable because I'm fed up with sharing my bed with these two you know what I mean mm -hmm. so actually if we give the time to dogs when they feel safe they can be left alone when they feel safe they can sleep alone but I think the dog has to be part of that decision making yeah. and when they are young when they are puppies and very young dogs they cannot be alone because they cannot take the responsibility for themselves and they know that they feel mm. that they have no safety around them so when you if you're going to get a puppy there are a couple of things you have to think about you make the house puppy safe you take away the things that you do not want to, to be destroyed in some way if you have persian uh, rugs you take them away because there will be uh, spoiling on them when the puppy is there that's that's for sure you can take it back a few months later when that period is over it is so easy and that's what happened to the office again my poor office so mm -hmm. when molly went through that phase we just kept putting stuff in the office that she was targeting and then tried to give her other outlets because she didn't care especially from a chewing what she chewed she just she would just chew the closest thing and the it, the only big casualty for molly is my footstool in the in the lounge area which she liked because it's wood and and i said to kieran do you know we got away with it really if that's the only casualty from a young mm -hmm. dog we did all right mm -hmm. another question here then um so oh let me bear, bear me a second uh lola says a dog that suffered electric collar this is working with, I'm guessing, on here. Uh, how can I help her to gain trust in humankind again? It's a, it's a tragedy. It's a tragic thing uh, on that. And any thoughts on that, either of you? I didn't quite get it. Did you get it, Steph? Yes, yeah, so, so, that, so that I think Lola's working with somebody whose dog has had an electric shock collar used in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. But now she's helping the owners who are, on, who are on board with looking at doing things a bit differently. But how can they help to that dog to gain trust again after obviously it's been exposed to the shock collar. I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Uh, is, is it a, a general distrust in things? Yeah, I think, a... I think if we were to change this for me, when a dog has experienced trauma, especially trauma within the home setting or within the what should be a safe social connection. How do we support that dog to start to feel safe when perhaps they have you, you just take away the thing that uh, distraught her and you let her find out by herself, having choices, complete choices of what to do, where to go, what to explore, whatever. Uh, it might take uh, long in the beginning, some dogs who have who are really afraid of things, it might take a long time before they start to dare to do things, and then it comes faster and faster and faster if they are let. Don't mess it up with trying to lure them, trying to use treats and the praise and do all these things that people do. Forget about it. It should be 100 percentage the choice of the dog. And that's powerful because when we have when we have a trauma informed process, especially, it's amazing how many times when the dog starts to feel a bit safer, that's when they might start barking at the postman. For example, they might start oh yes playing up. They, uh, when and, they start, that's a good sign get, because they're feeling safe. They start, now. When they start to get braver and really feel, oh, I can do this. They might have a period where they go overboard with it and overdo things. And you know, don't start correct it. That's you so can cool. try, you can start gently to use a hand signal and mm. small things like that, but that's all. It's just a period because I have also seen young people who have been very much under 
the thumbs of their parents at home and then they go to school somewhere else and they go completely out of it. Uh, they have parties and they just run around and be totally idiots for a period of time. Mm. It's the same with dogs. I just like, it's not very helpful, I know. Um, but one of our dogs before we got her had, she had a shock collar on and she had, she was tied up. Um, and we've had her two years now and she's still incredibly nervous. She'll still yelp if she sees a hand come out. And um, mm. so I think it can be a very, a very long process. And I have to say, we yeah. haven't done anything other than try and create a nice, safe environment for her and give her, as Tour had said, as much choice and freedom as possible. But I don't think you can always undo the damage. No, uh, I, I agree. In, it, there are cases where it is uh, really difficult because they can also have got some physical uh, defects from the, the, the trauma of the shock collar. It, it can affect the brain, definitely. Oh, it uh, does. And also that, yeah. the nerve system. Yes, absolutely. But in most cases, that's the most normal is that even if it takes time, they do learn to cope with it if this, uh, the surroundings are right for it and she can have all the freedom that she needs mm. for it. And this is the thing about not setting those expectations about where we need to get to. Mm. You know, every, every gesture that is connected, every move that feels safer is better. Mm. You know, um, well, look, there's more comments and things, but you know, we're we're at the end now, sadly. So sorry I couldn't ask all the questions, but um, it's been an amazing conversation, both of you. Thank you so much. The, the comments in the group have been amazing. Um, and uh, oh, Kim's in the group. We mentioned Kim earlier. Mentioned your book earlier, Kim. Kim Brophy, great to see you, Kim. Uh, so yeah, how to raise a puppy? A dog-centric approach uh, is the book um, at all good bookstores, including Amazon and everything else, I guess. Uh, and I really highly recommend it. It's a, it's a great book. It's beautifully put together as well. It's, uh, um, and I love the fact that we've got um, we've got a bit of a case study with Scout, of course. So we follow Scout's journey as well and, and the ups and downs that come with it. And that, that picture of him with his little kind of bloody nose where he got into a bit of a skirmish with the cat. You know, so that's another learning experience. He survived the cat. But he's learned something really important now about the cat, right? That's important yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Scout's still doing very great. well. I, I was talking to Scout's owner yesterday, if anyone's wondering, and he's three years old now, and he's he's a great little dog. Um, but yeah, the other thing we we would, I suppose, ask, or I would ask, is that if people do get the book and they enjoy it, um, it'd be great if they could leave feedback and reviews. That's always really helpful, I think, for raising the profile and hopefully yeah. getting the book into more hands. For sure, and I've got to write mine actually. When I do, I'll share that back in the group again. Oh, thank you. So we can just keep pushing this in. Um, this conversation is going to be up on the YouTube channel, so uh, YouTube YouTube channel. So when it is, we can we can share that out. And I think one thing to bear in mind is when we start thinking about things differently, uh, we can often feel a bit guilty, right? Because we think, oh God, I did that with my puppy, and I did that with my dog. And I've talked about this before, but I think guilt is something that we should just acknowledge a bit more positively because guilt for me is a sign yep. of visceral learning that we've learned something mm -hmm. very deep and profound and the old adage you know if you know better do better we're all learning all the time there's no real mm -hmm. rights and wrongs about stuff it's just about allowing ourselves to be more present and more and everybody and does mistakes everybody mm -hmm. there's no doubt so the, the good thing about it is that if you get a bad conscience about something just turn it to doing things right and dogs are so adaptable yeah, they will true. change yeah and actually having worked with in human therapy and with animals i can tell you animals are easier <laughs> Humans, <laughs> we're not really so you've heard it here guys even to read rugas has made mistakes so that's great <laughs> yes. for us all to know it's very humbling to read. that's great well wonderful thank you both uh so much tonight thank you everybody uh being in the group um we've got another facebook live next tuesday with the lovely daniel shaw looking at the neurobiology of trauma which is going to be really interesting for us um and uh, thank you both so much it's meant a lot to have you both here tonight thanks a million andrew and thanks to okay. bye thank you bye bye, -bye.